All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about custody jurisdiction today. Um, just a brief overview. Oh, and by the way, um, John Bogdanovich is also, he's going to be chiming in. Um, he's done a lot of cases relating to this, so I'm hoping that he can relay some of his real life experience and stories. Um, we're going to talk a little bit first about jurisdiction versus venue, um, and then the Uniform Child Custody Jurisdiction and Enforcement Act. I know that's a mouthful and it sounds really dry, but I promise you it's pretty interesting. Um, the features um, and basic um, uh, like overlying themes of that set of statutes is an emphasis on the home state, on exclusive continuing jurisdiction, um, communication between the courts of different states, um, provisions involving emergency jurisdiction, uh, registration and broad enforcement of orders from other states, um, a procedure to obtain a warrant to take physical custody of the child and um, international application as well. Um, so first, people often speak about custody jurisdiction when they're really talking about venue. Um, jurisdiction is the authority over the parties and the subject matter, and venue refers to the forum that is most convenient and best serves the interests of justice. Um, but the distinction in custody is really blurry, and there are a few reasons for that. Um, one is that there is no personal jurisdiction really in custody cases. Um, rather than personal jurisdiction, you would do the analysis um, that you need to do for venue um, or for jurisdiction. We're going to talk about both. Um, but in Pennsylvania, they're pretty much the same. Um, the concept of venue is incorporated into and governed by the UCCJEA, um, and the UCCJEA doesn't just apply to interstate custody cases, it also applies to intrastate custody cases. So even if you have a custody dispute um, between parties residing in you know, two different Pennsylvania counties, um, the law that we're gonna talk about today applies to those cases as well. Um, venue is covered by uh, Rule 1915.2 of the Pennsylvania Rules of Civil Procedure. Um, the provision is very similar to the UCCJEA, um, but also lacks certain um, restrictions so that not every court that has proper venue will also have jurisdiction. Um, and there is some case law that talks about the interplay between jurisdiction and venue. Um, I have the quotation here. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, but there are, I think the important part is the quotation from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court stating that the rules of venue recognize the propriety of imposing geographic limitations on the exercise of jurisdiction. So um, the rule about venue states that an action can be brought in any county which is the home county of the child at the time of commencement of the proceeding or which had been the child's home county within six months before commencement of the proceeding and they're absent but a parent or acting as a parent continues to live in the county. Um, and then there are several provisions that allow for um, venue to be proper when number one doesn't apply. Um, and I am going to go over them in more detail when we cover very similar provisions in jurisdiction. Um, and you'll see that there, this rule really mirrors the law regarding jurisdiction under the UCCJEA. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of them yet. Um, I think the important thing to note from the rule about venue is that 
um, the court can at any time transfer an action to the appropriate court of any other county um, if the action could have originally been brought there, if the court determines that it is an inconvenient forum. So um, that inconvenient forum provision is also incorporated into the UCCJEA. Um, and there's a, an official note to the rule where this says note at the bottom. This is not my note. This is a note to the actual rule, which references the UCCJEA um, and points out that even where a court may have proper venue, it may decline to exercise its jurisdiction. So the UCCJEA um, has been adopted in every state except for Massachusetts. Um, so we're leaving out Massachusetts today, um, but they do have the prior version of the statute. Um, Pennsylvania adopted the UCCJEA in 2004. It governs very broadly, it governs state courts jurisdiction to make and modify custody determinations. Uh, it requires the enforcement of determinations made by courts of other states and establishes procedures for interstate enforcement. So initial child custody jurisdiction. Um, and if you looked over the venue rule, you'll notice that this really mirrors that. Um, the general rule that a court of this commonwealth has jurisdiction if this commonwealth is the home state of the child on the date of the commencement of the proceeding or was the home state of the child within six months before the commencement of the proceeding and the child is absent from this commonwealth but a parent or person acting as a parent continues to live in this commonwealth. Now, you'll notice that it says, um, you know, that it, if it was the home state of the child within six months before the commencement of the proceeding. And that may contradict the, you know, the commonly known rule that the child for custody action to be filed in a county, the child must have been living there for at least six months. Um, that is incorporated into the statutory definition of home state. Um, and that's defined as the state in which a child lived with a parent or a person acting as a parent for at least six consecutive months immediately before the commencement of the proceeding. Um, and if it's a child who's less than six months old, then it just means since birth. Um, so there are situations where um, there may not be a home state, and that's where the other sections of the rule come in. Um, but if there is a home state, then the home state always has priority. Um, and that's sort of except in cases of temporary emergency custody, which we'll talk about later. Um, but the home state, the other methods of acquiring jurisdiction don't come into play if there is a home state under section one. Um, or if the home state has declined to exercise jurisdiction. Um, and there's two main reasons why that can happen. Um, states may decline jurisdiction if it's an inconvenient forum that's permissive. Uh, states must decline jurisdiction in cases of unjustifiable conduct. Um, and there is a section of the UCCJEA about that. Um, and, and there are exceptions. Uh, there are exceptions to the exceptions, um, but generally, um, if jurisdiction exists because of the unjustified conduct of the person who is seeking to invoke jurisdiction there, for instance, um, you know, a parent abducts the child and successfully establishes a new home state um, and then files for custody. Um, the court must decline jurisdiction there. Now, the exceptions would be, um, you know, consent or participation in the unjustifiable conduct by the other party. Um, and this decline of jurisdiction does not apply to victims of domestic violence who are fleeing abuse. Um, the statute specifies that if that is being claimed by the petitioner, the court is to conduct an inquiry. Um, into the allegations of 
uh, domestic violence because that should not, they should not be punished for that. Diane, um, in that situation, is it the home state that does the inquiry or is it the new state that the parent fled to that does the inquiry or do you know? So it, it so the new state where the, so, okay, let's say mom flees, comes to Pennsylvania from another state. Um, we'll just pick South Carolina. Um, mom comes to Pennsylvania with the child um, and files for custody here stating that she's fleeing abuse. There's, um, the court here, um, when mom claims that she's fleeing abuse, the court here is to conduct the inquiry, but they're also bound to communicate with the court in mom's home state um, if there is an existing action down there. Um, so, I, I mean, if there hasn't been anything filed in South Carolina, then I, I don't think that they need to communicate with the courts, but um, we will talk a little bit more about the provisions of the UCCJEA um, regarding communication between courts of different states. Um, and that is one of the cases where the courts of different states should be communicating with one another. So. Um, okay. So if there's no home state um, or if the home state declines jurisdiction, um, then and um, the child and the child's parents or the child and at least one parent or party who's acting as a parent um, has a significant connection with this Commonwealth other than their mere physical presence and substantial evidence is available in this Commonwealth concerning the child's care, protection, training, and personal relationships. Um, so you can see this coming into play if you know there isn't, let's say a child that's been kind of bouncing around a lot and maybe has been living back and forth in two different states and neither one is really the home state, um, probably both states would, depending on the facts, um, fall under this category. Um, um, hold on. Okay. Um, so Pennsylvania may also take jurisdiction of the case if all courts having jurisdiction under the home state um, or the second section have declined to exercise jurisdiction on the grounds that a court of Pennsylvania is the more appropriate forum, um, or if no court of any other state would have jurisdiction under any of these provisions. Um, and the physical presence uh, and this goes to what I was saying before, there's no personal jurisdiction in a custody case. If you meet the jurisdiction requirements for the case, it doesn't matter if a party to the action, you know, doesn't have significant contacts with Pennsylvania or that they would otherwise not have, um, that Pennsylvania courts would not otherwise have personal jurisdiction over the party. So once a court has made a custody determination, it retains exclusive jurisdiction until a court determines that there is no longer any significant connection um, or neither the parties nor the child lives here anymore. Um, this is a concept known in the UCCJEA as exclusive continuing jurisdiction. Um, and so basically either a court of Pennsylvania could um, make a determination in a situation where at least one parent and the child um, are no longer in the Commonwealth and that the substantial evidence about the child's care is not available in this Commonwealth anymore. Um, or a Pennsylvania court or another state's court can determine that um, the child and any uh, party to the action um, do not presently reside in the state. Um, and that's actually gonna overlap with 
um, something we're going to talk about in a little bit, which has to do with, you know, where a transfer is going to be filed. Um, so it's important for the courts to communicate with one another under um, under the UCC JEA. And so it's actually codified um, the requirement for communication. Um, communication, um, well, it's permissive for the most part. Um, there are specific sections that will require communication in certain instances. Um, but generally, it's something that the courts do pretty frequently when you're talking about transferring a case or if an emergency petition is filed in one state and there is um, uh, a custody determination that's been made somewhere else. Um, the courts will generally cooperate with each other pretty well. Um, from a practice standpoint, um, you should usually file a motion to transfer jurisdiction in the court where there is an existing case. Um, and the court, that court will then communicate with the court to which you are seeking to transfer the case. Um, but there are exceptions to that. Um, for instance, where maybe, you know, none of the parties reside in the home state anymore. Um, it may be preferable to actually file the action in a new state and have the case transfer to you rather than having the original state transfer it out. Um, but in either case, the courts are gonna have to communicate with each other, usually. Um, although once or twice, um, well, at least once I've seen it happen where the new state just made a determination without consulting the prior one. Um, if you are filing a motion to transfer a case out of a jurisdiction to a new one, um, that new court that you're wanting to take jurisdiction may require something to be filed with them uh, so that they have an open docket under which they can create a record. Um, that happens to me with the case that I was working on with Texas. Um, if a party tries to file a new custody action when, oh, and by the way, I don't really know how to handle that. That client ended up ghosting me, um, <laughs> but uh, they wanted to have something filed and obviously I can't um, practice in Texas. Um, and in that case, you know, I had encouraged the client to seek out some kind of legal aid organization there. Um, if a party tries to file a new custody action when one already exists in another jurisdiction, um, the court will usually reject or dismiss the filing for that reason. I know that happens here in Lucerne County frequently, um, and it will ask right in the custody paperwork if there is um, an existing custody order anywhere else, um, or if you're aware of any other custody cases in this Commonwealth or in another state, um, and all those questions are laid out. If anybody answers yes to those, um, really the court should be making the determination. Um, but you may even have some rogue administrators uh, who won't dock at the action. Um, but there is a um, there is the option for the new state to exercise jurisdiction and issue an order determining that the other state no longer has continuing or exclusive jurisdiction. Remember, that's a determination that can be made by the original state or by another state. Um, so that will usually occur after communication between the two courts. Um, Communication is also important in temporary emergency jurisdiction. And this is the provision that would allow um, a person to um, file uh, a custody petition in one state, say in, say in Pennsylvania, even though there's an existing custody action in another state that has not been transferred here um, because uh, 
well, either the child has to have been abandoned or it is necessary um, in an emergency to protect the child because the child or sibling or parent of the child is subjected to or threatened with mistreatment or abuse. So you'll see that it does not have to be the child um, necessarily who is um, in danger of abuse. It can be uh, the parent, if the parent is fleeing a domestic violence situation and that can grant temporary emerg emergency jurisdiction and custody. Um, now, the, uh, the order issued in an emergency case um, under this section is not indefinite. It's supposed to state um, that uh, a time period for which it um, is going to be in effect. Um, and it be- I'd like, and I'd like to ask, has anyone that has done custody work and had an emergency order ever had a judge put a time limit on how long the temporary order is in place. I've had several cases where, you know, temporary emergency is entered in an interstate case, but I've never had a case where there's been a temporary order put in place with a, a time deadline. I don't know if anyone else has had that. I think as an advocate, if it does happen in the future, we should ask, point out to the court that it has to be for, you know, a time certain, uh, you know, period and that it should be included in the temporary order. I, John, I had a case like that and it's been a couple of years back. So I'm trying to remember, I know that we got uh, temporary emergency jurisdiction because there was a PFA in place, um, but there was another custody case filed in North Carolina, if I'm not mistaken, and that's where the jurisdiction was supposed to be. Um, but mom fled with the child and filed for a PFA here. And I think, again, I don't remember 100% because I have to look at the case, but I think um, we end up with a hearing in front of the judge and judge issued a, a temporary um, uh, custody order granting primary custody to my client. Um, and I think it was put in place up until the case in North Carolina, up until the court in North Carolina will issue a custody order. Um, so it wasn't necessarily like 30 days or 60 days but, but this um, custody order was good up until another custody order was issued by North Carolina. Okay. Something along that line. Yeah. Right. Well, that, that would, I believe, work also, even though it's not a date certain. So the time period being defined is only required if there is um, a previous custody determination in another state. Um, there can be a situation where there's temporary emergency jurisdiction and there is no pre-existing order. It's just that Pennsylvania wouldn't otherwise have um, jurisdiction for an initial determination. Um, and so you'd be filing under this provision of the statute even without that pre-existing order. Most commonly, I think there is an existing order in another state. Um, and the law states that um, the court must specify in the order a period that the court considers adequate to allow the person seeking an order to obtain an order from the state having jurisdiction. Um, now, and it states that, you know, the order issued in this Commonwealth is in effect until an order is obtained from the other state within the period specified or the time period expires. So the way, so the way that it's supposed to work um, is that it's basically giving the petitioner a set amount of time um, to, you know, have temporary relief, but seek um, a more permanent order from 
the state that has jurisdiction. However, there's also mandatory communication between the courts in this situation. And like, I think that you could foresee situations where um, the court in the home state, you know, consents to, you know, that time period being lengthened. Um, and I think all of us know, like, as John was saying, the court's going to do what they want. They may issue an order and not include a time period, which I think is going to create a situation, well, perhaps create some complicated jurisdictional questions later on when somebody wants to modify the emergency order. Right, John? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have a case um, right now just like that. Uh, but if there is no previous custody determination in another state, then that emergency order is going to become a final determination um, if nobody commences um, or has commenced uh, proceedings in another state. So um, now enforcement, uh, there's broad enforcement included in the UCCJEA. Um, and just so everybody knows, there's a lot in the UCCJEA. This, this, everything that I'm giving you here today is really just an overview. I'm not by any means even covering every section um, or every principle on the law. It's just kind of a general idea. Um, and that's especially true for the enforcement provisions because they can get pretty detailed. Um, but in general, the court has the duty to enforce child custody determinations made by other states. Um, so remember that the UCCJEA is, has been adopted, um, right? That's the uniform part. That's the important part um, in 49 of the 50 states. And so um, basically all the states have agreed to enforce each other's child custody determinations. Um, if enforcement is sought in Pennsylvania, while modification is pending in another state, uh, the courts are supposed to communicate with one another. A uh, custody order from another state may be registered in Pennsylvania by sending to the appropriate court a request letter with a certified copy of the other state's order, an affidavit attesting to its authenticity, along with the names and addresses of all the parties having custodial rights under the order. Now, there's no need really to register the custody order because it doesn't have to be registered to be enforceable under the UCCJEA, right? We're enforcing all child custody determinations made by other states. Um, the reason for doing it um, that I can find, and, and maybe somebody else has something to add, but having registering that order can preclude a challenge by a respondent if you later need to seek expedited enforcement uh, under the UCCJEA. And that's a procedure for, you know, this is this is the situation that you see when somebody, you know, gets a court order, um, they have an out of state custody order and now the other party is withholding the children from them and they petition the court and go and get a court order saying it's like a produce the children order, right? Like you're coming to court tomorrow and bringing the children with you and turning them over to this other party. So in order to accomplish that, um, if you ever get this kind of case, uh, it's very detailed. So this is the, the section of the statute. Um, you would submit a verified petition demanding immediate physical custody you have to attach a certified copy of the order that you're seeking to enforce. Um, and if you did register your order in Pennsylvania, then you would also attach the order confirming registration. Um, the hearing, uh, according to the statute, the hearing must be held on the next judicial day after service of the order. Uh, unless that date is impossible. And then in that case, it states that the court shall hold the hearing on the first judicial day possible. Uh, but then it does state that the court may extend the date of the hearing at the request of petitioner. There's no option to extend the hearing date at the request of the respondent for these cases. 
Um, the respondent can contest the validity of the determinations sought to be enforced. So the out of state custody order um, that the petitioner wants to enforce, um, the respondent can't really try to argue about the substance of that order because Pennsylvania doesn't have jurisdiction to modify it anyway. Um, and really the only type of defense they can assert at the hearing um, at, in one of these expedited enforcement proceedings is that the orders that the petitioner is seeking to enforce is invalid in some way. Um, either um, it's not accurate or it hasn't, um, it's been vacated or stayed or modified since, um, since it was entered. Um, and they would have to, if the determination was registered in Pennsylvania, they have, a, they're, they're going to have a harder time basically um, trying to assert a defense like this because they would literally just have to produce another order um, that vacates or stays or modifies the order that you're trying to enforce. Um, other enforcement provisions. Um, allow for the court to award costs, fees, and expenses. Um, they allow for the court to grant additional relief, including uh, procuring the assistance of law enforcement officials. Um, the court can set a further hearing to determine whether additional relief is appropriate. Um, and there's a whole section of the statute that provides for a procedure to obtain a warrant to take physical custody of the child uh, where the petition seeking enforcement has been filed and the child is immediately likely to suffer serious physical harm or be removed from Pennsylvania. Um, and interestingly, um, this applies internationally as well. Um, the, many of you probably have heard of the Hague Convention that is um, a treaty entered by the United States and most other countries, um, basically agreeing to enforce each other's um, child custody orders with a lot of asterisks um, and exceptions. But under the UCCJEA, we treat foreign countries as a state. Um, now we do look for, if you look at section B, um, a child custody determination made in a foreign country under factual circumstances in substantial conformity with the jurisdictional standards of this chapter must be recognized and enforced under subchapter C. Um, and of course there's um, a caveat if it is a, uh, a child custody law um, that violates fun fundamental principles of human rights. Um, we have a sample case. Oh, one more thing. If anybody does, I've never seen this come up personally, but if anybody does have interest in the international type cases and how those are enforced, um, if you log into the plan um, member site um, where there are resources from past trainings and past plan conferences. Um, there's a bunch of resources from a few years ago, it might have been sometime between 2017 and 2019. I think at one of the plan conferences, there was a whole section at, about international, like child abducting and international custody disputes. Um, and the Hague Convention. And there are a lot of resources attached to it. So you can always look that up. Um, now we have a sample case here. Um, John, do you wanna? Sure, I can take it here. over. Um, we do have about 10 minutes left. So this will probably end the training. But the sample case uh, is a jurisdiction and venue case, surprise, surprise. Um, dad and mom are parents of Jerry, age seven. Jerry and his parents lived in South Carolina and split up in 2018. The custody order was entered in 2018 in, in South Carolina, providing mom with primary custody and dad every other weekend and two months in the summer. The parents both moved from South Carolina in 2019. 
mom and the child to New York State and dad to Pennsylvania. In 2020, mom filed a special relief custody petition in New York, alleging dad is physically abusive in his discipline. At that hearing, the parties agreed to a new custody order giving mom, mom primary and dad one weekend a month and two months in the summer. Um, something that's not in here, but I want to infer that dad did not object to New York having jurisdiction since there was an existing order in South Carolina. But according to the training you just heard, because neither parent nor the child resided in South Carolina, it, it's probably be a, a, a very weak argument on dad's behalf to advocate that, Susqu yeah, that South Carolina had continuing jurisdiction. So there's a new order in New York State. Um, in June 2021, mom and child both moved in with dad in Pennsylvania. In August of 2021, mom moves back to New York, leaving Jerry with dad. So between August of 2021 and April of 2022, mom would come to New Pennsylvania occasionally for a weekend visit, but not take Jerry back to New York at all. April of 2020, mom takes Jerry for a visit to New York and files a PFA in New York, alleging that dad has physically abused Jerry by hitting him on his behind with a stick on his legs. Dad then files an emergency petition in Pennsylvania, alleging mom has a history of drug abuse and has also left Jerry with third parties for weeks at a time when Jerry lived with mom in New York State. So the questions here are, there's a PFA hearing schedule in New York, as well as an emergency hearing schedule in Pennsylvania. Who do you think would have better chance at jurisdiction here, the PFA hearing or the emergency hearing? Does anyone have any ideas? Okay. Well, usually, the, the, you know, the PFA, if she's fleeing from violence, um, it, it should be in New York State. However, basically, she's using the PFA in New York State to avoid jurisdiction in Pennsylvania. Um, this was actually my case. But the judge here made the determination that the con con you know, continuing jurisdiction of this case was really the the uh, the order that was agreed upon by both parties um, in 2019 in 2020 giving mom primary custody and dad one week in a month and two weeks two months in the summer so the the court here in Pennsylvania said that that was the existing custody order and you know that would prevail as the continuing jurisdiction so the court here dismissed dad's petition for emergency custody and said that he had to go litigate the case out in New York State under the PFA and that the existing order was the 2000, you know, 2021 order where mom and dad had agreed on a custody, um, you know, schedule. Um, the issue is that South Carolina does not have jurisdiction, obviously, according to Diane's presentation and the law, since neither parent nor the child resided in South Carolina, any claim of continuing jurisdiction under the South Carolina order um, would, not, would not be upheld. The parties in the New York order um, had agreed and they ignored the South Carolina order. There was no mention of it in the new order from New York City. And that is the controlling order um, and now with the competing two orders, the PFA in Pennsylvania or in New York and emergency custody in Pennsylvania, the court decided that existing jurisdiction was the agreement that was made in New York two years prior. That's interesting, John. I think that, um, I think under the, under the provisions of the UCCJEA that we just talked about, Pennsylvania probably didn't have much of a choice um, because under that statute, it's only the state that has made 
the existing custody determination um, that's allowed to um, decide that it no longer has jurisdiction as long as at least one of the parties and or the child is there. So even though mom was living in Pennsylvania prior because she went back to New York and filed there, I think that New York was the only state at that point that would have had the authority to state that jurisdiction no longer belonged there. Right. My strongest argument was that the child had lived more than six months in Pennsylvania continuously and that the home state should be considered Pennsylvania because he spent like nine months consecutively here before mom took him back without that permission to New York State. Yeah, and I think you would hope that like the court in New York would maybe recognize that and relinquish jurisdiction under those circumstances, but um, do you, did the, John, did, did the court here actually communicate with the New York court in this case? No, of course not. <laughs> He showed up for the emergency petition and, you know, they we both said our arguments and they said, oh, well, the existing order is from New York State, so they, they're the proper jurisdiction and venue, so we're denying the emergency petition here in Pennsylvania and you have to go to New York and deal with it in the PFA hearing in New York State. Well, I guess I probably should have made a disclaimer at the beginning of the presentation that like, I can only tell you what the law is and then courts are gonna do what they're gonna do, right? Right. Well, it's one thing to say what the law is and it's a completely different ball game to say what the courts are gonna do. Yeah. Cite the law and the facts. Yep. Okay, I guess the last question is, we have like three minutes to go. Does anyone have an interesting case that they wanted to share that they can explain in three minutes or less? <laughs> okay. So Mike Bunt is not on the call. I don't think he just had a, a kind of complicated jurisdictional case. Similar, John, to what you talked about, but our client uh, moved here from North Carolina. It's always one of the Carolinas, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> and uh, they had, um, well, originally there was an order out of Lycoming County. Lycoming, a custody order, Lycoming County custody order uh, relinquished jurisdiction and the parties moved to North Carolina. No custody was ever filed in North Carolina. Um, mom, moved back and the child stayed with dad in North Carolina. Uh, child was here over the summer and disclosed to mom the father had been abusing her. And so mom filed a PFA here. And um, the, uh, the father um, then objected to jurisdiction here. And um, so they had a pretty complicated uh, hearing um, you know, uh, in which the court determined that we did not have jurisdiction, but um, essentially the court said that uh, uh, because Lycoming County had relinquished jurisdiction and North Carolina was uh, the, the home state of the child, um, Pennsylvania didn't have jurisdiction over the case. We think they were wrong, but um, we ended up filing a motion for reconsideration and had a hearing just recently on that, which the judge also ruled against us on. Uh, in the meantime, dad did file a petition in North Carolina um, and there was a hearing that has just been continued and continued and continued. So there's nothing pending at this point, or there's a pending petition, but no hearing and no resolution. Um, so uh, I think mom got an attorney down in North Carolina and filing a petition for custody in North Carolina as well as a, uh, their equivalent of a PFA uh, down there at this point because the courts here won't, won't hear what she has to say. Okay. That, well, this, these are good examples of how complicated things could be 
in UCC JEA cases. And I would encourage everyone that if you get involved in one of those cases to look at all the statutes and the case law very, very closely because it's a very complicated area.